This is chapter 20, part B, on the immune system, looking at the innate and adaptive body defenses. Right, so in part A, we looked at the innate or inborn defenses. So the first and second lines of defense with your uh, skin, surface barriers, mucous membranes, and then the second line of defense was the uh, cells, antimicrobial proteins, um, inflammation, and fever response. So this section will look at the second branch of the immune system with the adaptive immune system. So the adaptive system is a specific defense system. Um, so it's able to eliminate virtually any pathogen or abnormal cell in the body. Let's remember the innate system was non-specific. It's pretty much anything that is non-self or foreign would be attacked. Where the adaptive, we're only going to target specific types of cells. Um, so a downside to this adaptive system is that it has to be primed first by initial exposure to that specific foreign substance. Um, and this priming process takes a little bit of time. Um, so some characteristics of the adaptive immune system, uh, one is that it is specific, again, so it's going to recognize and target specific antigens. Right? Um, and it is systemic, so it's body-wide. It's not restricted to the initial site. So whereas like um, with inflammation, right, it's only in that localized injured area. Um, and the adaptive system has memory. So um, after we're exposed to a pathogen or an antigen, we keep a record of it in our immune system. So if we ever encounter that potential pathogen again, we already um, recognize it faster um, and know how to attack it. Um, so two main branches of the adaptive system are the humoral branch, which is going to um, involve your antibodies, and then the uh, cellular branch involves the T cells. So looking at humoral immunity first, right, so this is going to involve the antibodies produced by uh, the B lymphocytes. Right? So antibodies work by binding temporarily to a target cell, um, which helps to inactivate it and also mark it for destruction by phagocytes or that complement. Right? Um, so humoral immunity has extracellular targets, so it attacks things on the outside of the cell. So um, Humoral immunity antibodies, they don't necessarily destroy cells themselves, but they do um, kind of tag and mark them so our other cells in the immune system know which cells need to be um, killed or attacked. Um, so with cellular immunity, we're looking with the T cells, the T lymphocytes. So these act directly um, or indirectly against the target cells, infected cells. So we can directly kill infected cells or indirectly um, release chemicals to enhance that inflammatory response or activate other um, immune cells. Right? So this would have cellular targets, intracellular targets. Right, so talk about antigens. So what is an antigen? So an antigen is any substance that can trigger an immune response. So antigen is short for antibody generating. So we generate antibodies against foreign um, substances in the body. Right? So antigens are anything that's going to trigger an immune response um, in antibody production. Right? So antigens typically are um, proteins or things on the surface of a cell that are not normally found in our own body cells. So a little bit we'll talk about the self antigens, so how our immune system distinguishes between me and not me. Okay. Um, but again with the specificity of the adaptive system, we said it was specific, right? So this just means that antibodies are specific for certain antigens. So it's kind of like a lock and key mechanism or a puzzle piece. So they have to fit together um, for that particular antigen. Right, so we already talked about these a little bit with blood typing. Right, so um, it's going to work essentially the same way. So the different blood types are determined by the antigens or the proteins on their surface. Um, and then the antibodies in, um, say, donated blood could be what would um, trigger that transfusion reaction. So if someone that is um, type A, right, and they would have the anti-B antibodies, so if they were to receive a B-type blood, now those anti-B antibodies are going to bind 
to those B antigens and cause the cells to clump and rupture. Um, and again, this is showing how antigens are specific, so that locking key or puzzle piece kind of fit. Okay, so the self antigens are called the MHC proteins. MHC stands for major histocompatibility complex, but it's essentially um, your self marker. So all of your cells have your own version of an MHC protein that our immune cells are able to recognize so that way we don't attack our own healthy body cells. Um, so again, our own MHC protein antigens aren't antigenic to our cell, so it's not going to cause a reaction of your own cells, but it may be antigenic to others in transfusions or um, grafts or transplants. So again, back to the, um, the blood typing, blood donation example. Right, so someone that is type B that donates to someone that's type A. So those B antigens would cause a reaction in that A blood person. Okay. So self marker, again MHC, labels the body cells as a friend. So they're not going to be attacked by the immune system. So anything that doesn't have that self marker um, is going to be recognized as foreign or non-self and treated as a foe. So the adaptive immune system involves three crucial types of cells. So we've already talked about um, a little bit B cells and T cells. So these are the two types of lymphocytes. So B lymphocytes or B cells um, are going to be in control over your humoral immunity, so the antibody immunity. T cells oversee cellular immunity. Um, and then a third type of cell involved in the immune response are antigen presenting cells. So these don't necessarily respond to the antigens, they only play kind of an auxiliary role. So they're going to, um, if they encounter an antigen, right, they are not the ones who make the final say in whether it should warrant a full-blown immune response, right? So the antigen presenting cell will bring that antigen from that um, foreign cell to a um, T cell, right? so to one of the lymphocytes. So the lymphocyte will kind of double check the antigen to make sure it's non-self and it is pathogenic or is foreign, um, and then it will um, initiate the immune response from that point. So looking at lymphocytes, their development, maturation, and activation. So we've already talked about how all blood cells originate from the bone marrow. So T and B cells have that sh uh, shared common development um, in their life cycle. So they're both going to originate in that red bone marrow, just like all other blood cells. Um, so second step would be maturation. So the lymphocytes have to mature and become educated in those primary lymphoid organs. So the B cells are going to travel, or they're going to stay in the bone marrow where they will um, continue to develop and mature. The T cells are going to travel to the thymus where they will go to finish their maturation. Um, so when we say maturation, we are talking about the lymphocytes have to become immunocompetent. So part of their maturation, their education, their training, right? They have to learn how to recognize uh, specific antigens, right? Um, and they also have to be able to recognize self antigens and not respond to those. So like we said, T cells mature in the thymus under um, negative and positive selection pressure tests. Right? So part of their schooling in the thymus is going to include a positive selection process. So the T cells um, have to be capable of recognizing that MHC self antigen. Right? So any cell that is unable or fails this test of MHC recognition will uh, result in apoptosis. So the cell will essentially be cold um, and killed off. Right? It won't be allowed to continue. So if we were to allow this cell to continue, even though it can't recognize MHC, then it's possible that it could, um, could uh, see the MHC on your own cell as a foreign and trigger an autoimmune response, which we don't want. 
Um, their, so their second test is a negative selection. So um, this would be where uh, we want the uh, they must not recognize that self antigens, right? So they have to be able to distinguish between self and non-self. So with B cells, they are, like I say, going to mature in the red bone marrow um, with the similar types of tests. So any that um, become self-reactive would be eliminated. So we don't want any self-reactive or immune cells that can't distinguish between self and non-self because that could lead to potential autoimmune disorders. Right. So the third step is seeding and uh, seeding the secondary lymphoid organs and circulation. So once the uh, B and T cells have finished their training, um, they're still considered naive because they've not yet been exposed to an antigen. So it's kind of like um, when you read about doing something in a book, right? but it's still not the same as actually doing it hands-on for real in person. So they've had all their training on know recognizing antigens but they haven't had any field experience yet so they're still considered naive okay. um, so once they finish their education they will be exported and travel to their um, their secondary lymphoid organs so things like the lymph node and the spleen okay. um, so for there that will be kind of where they um, will work to patrol and filter lymph tissues and search for any um, foreign materials. Right? Um, it's also going to increase their chances of encounter with an antigen. So remember the lymphatic system is going to take up all of that leaked fluid from tissues um, and return it to the circulation through this lymphatic system. Right? So if there are any pathogens in that um, lymphatic fluid then our lymphocytes will encounter it before it returns to the circulation. So step four is antigen encounter and activation. So our newly educated but still naive lymphocytes, when they first do encounter an antigen, um, that's going to kickstart their further development. Okay? So at this point, the antigen or the lymphocyte will be um, selected to differentiate into its active form after it's bonded to that antigen. So as long as we have the correct signals, I mean, we get kind of the go ahead from some of our regulatory mechanisms, then it will complete the differentiation process into the active form of the cell. Okay. So once the lymphocytes encountered an antigen, it's been activated, then we can undergo proliferation and differentiation. So proliferation is just where it's going to multiply relatively quickly. Um, so um, we're going to form copies or clones of that lymphocyte. Okay. So remember lymphocytes are formed in the bone marrow and they have to take time to mature in the uh, bone marrow of the thymus. So if we are dealing with an um, an infection right, at a certain point in time, we need those lymphocytes right now. We don't have time to wait for more to um, develop from the bone marrow and then mature right, in the thymus or the bone marrow. So we essentially will clone the lymphocytes that we already have. Right? So we have uh, to increase our numbers much more quickly. Okay? So these clones are going to be our effector cells that are going to work to fight off infections. Um, and then we'll have a few left over that will serve as memory cells that will kind of um, you know, put in our memory book so if we ever encounter that same antigen again, we're able to respond much more quickly. Alright, so just overview of so far what we've looked at with B cells and T cells. So the B cells are involved with humoral or antibody immunity. So they're going to secrete antibodies. Their primary targets are extracellular pathogens. Um, so they originate in the bone marrow and they also mature in the bone marrow. So the um, effector cell of the B cell is the plasma cell. So this is what's going to secrete antibodies. Okay? Um, and any cells that don't become plasma cells will be stored as memory cells. Okay? Uh, with T lymphocytes, they're going to control your cellular mediated immunity. Um, so they do not secrete antibodies. They're going to target your intracellular pathogens, so things like virus infected cells, cancer cells. Okay? 
Um, but just like all other blood cells, they do originate in the red bone marrow. Um, but they're going to travel to the thymus to finish their maturation and development. Okay, so T for thymus. Um, so effector cells of T cells include things like the cytotoxic Ts, which are going to be kind of your killing T cells. The helper Ts, which essentially help other cells of the immune system and help activate other aspects of the immune system. And regulatory T. So these help to regulate other aspects of the immune response so um, to help avoid autoimmune disorders and they do also uh, form memory cells as well right. um, so our third cell type involved in adaptive immunity are antigen presenting cells or APCs so again these aren't going to directly um, attack any infected cells all they're going to do are um, kind of engulf the antigens and then present those antigens to a T cell for recognition. So we have to get the T cell to check off on our antigen to make sure it's really something worth starting an immune response. So there's three types of antigen presenting cells. We have dendritic cells, macrophages, and B cells. Uh, so this is another little picture showing antigen presentation. So say a, a macrophage, a phagocyte, eats a bacteria. So then the part, antigen part of that bacteria will be displayed on the surface of the macrophage. So that way we can present it and show it to the helper T. So the helper T is going to say yay or nay. Right? It is a pathogenic antigen or it's not. So if it is, um, then we need to activate the T cell, which would kickstart an immune response. So dendritic cells are kind of the most important of the antigen presenting cells because this is their only job. Right? So macrophages and B cells do have other functions. Dendritic cells, their only function, their only job is antigen presentation. Right? So we had one job and that's what it is. So these are found in connective tissues, epidermis. Um, so they're going to eat or phagocytize pathogens that enter the tissues. Um, and then they'll go to the lymphatic system to present those antigens to our T cells that reside in the lymph nodes. So again, these are the most effective antigen presenter because that's their only job. They don't have anything else to do but catch and present antigens to T cells. So these are also going to serve as a key link between the innate and adaptive immunity. Macrophages, we've already talked about, they're also included in our second lines of defense, right, the innate system. Um, so these are widely distributed phagocytes in connective tissues as well as lymphoid organs. Um, so they present antigens to T cells. Um, so we can activate the T cell and we can also further activate the macrophage. So macrophages naturally will go around and try to eat things, but once it's been activated, um, its appetite increases exponentially. So it becomes a voracious phagocytic killer now. Okay. Um, it can also help to trigger our inflammatory responses or recruit additional defenses. So it can um, call in for backup depending on the severity of the infection. Um, so B lymphocytes we've already talked about, but they also play a role in antigen presentation. So um, they're not able to activate the T cells like the dendritic cells or the macrophages do. Um, so B lymphocytes only present antigens to activate themselves. Okay? So say we have a B cell that notices an invader. So the B cell will capture it and display the antigen. So we show the antigen to our helper T cell. Helper T says, uh, looks like a non-cell, so go ahead. Right? Um, and so the T cell is going to give the B cell some cytokine, so some immune chemicals that allow it to become activated now. So once the B cell becomes activated, um, then we could trigger the humoral immune response. Okay. So when the B cell encounters that antigen and becomes activated, we like said it provokes the humoral immune response. So the B cells will start um, to produce plasma cells and antibodies. So that 
specific antigen that we just presented to the T cell. Right, so once we're activated, now we're going to make specific antibodies for that particular antigen. So similar um, steps that we talked about before with the um, antigen binding, activation, proliferation, and all of that. So same thing, so when we make our clones of the B cells, right? so again remember um, we need lots of immune cells but we don't have time to make new ones from the bone marrow. So we'll make clones and copies of ones that we already have. Right? Um, so most of these B cell clones will become plasma cells. So these are um, the effector cells that are going to have an effect by secreting antibodies. Right? Um, so they'll secrete antibodies at a rate of 2,000 molecules per second for four to five days and then they'll start to kind of die off. Right? So these newly formed antibodies are able to circulate throughout the blood and lymph. So if they encounter any of that particular antigen, they'll be able to bind to it, um, which marks it for destruction by other um, immune cells. So remember, antibodies don't directly kill any infected cells. They only kind of tag it and mark it for destruction by other cells. Um, so some of the clones that don't become plasma cells will become memory cells. Right? So a small percentage will keep kind of in storage or on the shelf um, just as a memory cell. So this would allow us to mount a more immediate response to future exposures of the same antigen. So immunological memory includes the primary immune response, which would be uh, kind of that first exposure, right, response to the first exposure of an antigen. So there's always a lag period of three to six days after initial exposure uh, because it takes time for those B cells and antibodies and things to kind of prepare themselves um, and proliferate. So generally peak levels of the antibody are reached after um, 10 days or so and then they'll start to decline. Um, so this makes sense if you think of if you, last time you had a cold or the flu, right? So um, you don't actually start to show symptoms until uh, maybe a couple days after you're exposed um, and then you don't start to feel better until a few days after that. So usually about a week, week and a half after the initial exposure you'll start to feel better as those antibody levels peak and take that um, pathogenic infection out of your bloodstream. So then the secondary response would be when you encounter that same antigen a second time. So this could be months, years later. Right? As long as you have those memory cells, they will recognize that antigen. So because we already have our memory established, we'll have a much more um, faster and prolonged and effective response. Right? So response within hours instead of days. So antibody levels will peak in um, two to three days as opposed to seven to ten days. And they're also going to bind with greater affinity. Um, and then from there they can remain high for um, several weeks or months. Right? Just kind of standing guard. So there's two general types of humoral immunity, active and passive. So if something is an active humoral immunity, that means when um, the B cells encounter antigens and produce specific antibodies against them. So in active humoral immunity, your B cells are actively uh, producing antibodies. Okay? Um, so two types of active humoral immunity include naturally acquired. So this would be just a normal response to your typical infection, so cold or flu. Um, so it's something that you acquired naturally right, from the environment, as opposed to an artificially acquired, uh, which would be an example of like a vaccine. So um, your B cells are still stimulated to produce antibodies, uh, but we're not going to suffer through you know, the full-blown infection of that disease. So we use just um, either dead version of a pathogen or a weakened version or sometimes even just the antigens from the pathogen. So we can take some certain proteins or antigens off of, say, a bacterial cell um, and use that for a vaccine because, remember, the immune system responds to antigens. Okay? Um, but it's still active because your B cells are producing those antibodies themselves.
So the other type was passive. So passive just means that the B cells aren't doing anything. So um, you gain the immunological benefits passively. So basically ready-made antibodies that were made somewhere else or just introduced into the body. So your own B cells aren't making these antibodies. Okay? Um, so in this case, then Im immunological memory does not occur since we don't have the whole process of um, antigen binding and activation, proliferation, and differentiation. Right? So we never generate those um, antibodies or immune cells. Right? So generally the benefits or protection of passive immunity is going to last only as long as those antibodies do. So they will naturally start to degrade and break down in your body over time. Okay, so it's temporary immunity. Um, so two types of passive include your naturally acquired. So this would be um, antibodies passed from the mother to baby through the placenta or through breast milk. Okay. Um, so as long as the baby is um, receiving the breast milk and receiving those antibodies, they'll be protected. Um, but once they stop nursing, so they stop receiving those antibodies, um, that protection is going to fade gradually over time. Okay. Artificially acquired would be an injection of antibody serum like a gamma globulin. So this would be um, for like an immediate protection. Um, in cases where, say, the infection would kill the person before their own immune system could make antibodies. So a common example of artificially acquired passive would be um, snake antivenom. Right? So um, our bodies could create antibodies against that venom, but the venom is going to work much faster than our immune system, and it would kill us before our immune system could make enough antibodies to counteract it. So we have to inject um, pre-made antibodies in a serum um, for antivenom. Okay, so we've talked about antibodies, but what are antibodies? Okay, so antibodies sometimes are called immunoglobulins. Okay? Um, so these are just proteins secreted by those plasma cells. Okay? Um, so they are going to bind specific antigens that are detected by um, B cells and other immune cells. Um, so there's five general classes of immune uh, or antibodies, immunoglobulins, um, and one way to remember them is MADG. So we'll go through and look at um, IgM, IgA, and so on. Um, but just basic antibody structure, so they're generally kind of T or Y shaped um, for the monomer. So we can have multiple monomers or these little Y shaped antibodies bonded together to form larger um, molecules, but just a basic antibody is this little Y shaped structure with uh, four different polypeptide chains. Mm -hmm. um, so the variable regions are going to be on the tips of the antibody here. So these are where the antigens are going to bind to. Mm -hmm. um, so the stem region is generally pretty constant um, and it's just more for like a structural component of the antibody. So the um, the variable regions or the the tips of the antibody are where antigens are going to bind. Right, so looking at the five major antibody classes, right, so remember MADG. So IgM is the first one. It is the largest of the antibodies um, and it's generally going to be the first one released. Right? So because it's the largest, it has 10 possible binding sites. So it's able to bind to more antigens than just a single antibody. IgA is found generally in secretions, um, things like mucus, saliva, sweat. Um, so a lot of your um, surface barriers. Right? So we talked about uh, the first line of defense. So some secretions in um, on your skin secretions. Some of these could include um, these IgA. So any bacteria that does get on the skin surface or get in your mouth uh, maybe we can uh, neutralize it with this IgA uh, antibody. IgD, so these are found on B cell surfaces and they're going to act kind of as a antigen receptor for the B cells. IgG is the only one that's capable of crossing the placenta. Right? Um, so it 
uh, can confer that passive immunity from the mother to the baby. All right, so this is the only one, like I said, that can pass the placenta. So one way to remember it, um, IgG, G for gestation. Um, and the last one, IgE. So this one is uh, more active in allergies or parasitic infections. It's going to um, cause those basophils to release histamine. Right? So it's going to kind of trigger that uh, inflammatory or allergic reactions. So again, antibodies don't destroy antigens. They merely inactivate and tag them. So they're going to form what's called an antigen antibody or immune complex. So some defense mechanisms used by antibodies include neutralization, um, agglutination or clumping, precipitation, and complement fixation. So neutralization would be probably the simplest, but one of the most important of our defense mechanisms. So neutralize meaning we're basically rendering it useless. So the antibodies are going to block those specific sites on uh, viruses or bacteria. Um, so this is going to prevent antigens from binding to receptors on tissue cells. So it's going to help prevent the pathogen from attaching to the host cell and infecting it. With agglutination, this is essentially like clumping. So antibodies can bind um, two different antigens at the same time. Um, so like with uh, blood clumping of mismatched uh, blood cells, right? That's agglutination. And so it's going to allow these antibody antigen complexes to kind of cross-link and form these large lattice-like clumps. Precipitation would be where soluble molecules instead of the cells are cross-linked into these complexes. So it's similar to agglutination, but instead of clumping cells, we're clumping um, antigens. So this is going to allow these uh, antibody antigen complexes to precipitate or kind of be drawn out of solution, out of the body fluids. Right? So it's easier for the phagocytes to engulf them. Okay. Um, complement fixation and activation. Um, so we already talked about complement a little bit before as part of the uh, second line of defense innate immune system. Um, so essentially just going to enhance or complement other aspects of the immune response. Okay. Um, so we can uh, trigger cell lysis um, as well as amplification of the inflammatory response and enhancing phagocytosis through that opsonization, right, or that basting of the, uh, the cell. Okay, so just a summary now of everything we've discussed so far and their functions in the immune response. So B cells are lymphocytes that mature in the bone marrow, right, so they're going to form plasma cells that produce antibodies as well as memory cells. Again, plasma cells are the antibody producing cells. Uh, helper T's, we'll talk about the different types of T cells shortly, but essentially helper T's just help activate other aspects of the immune response. Cytotoxic T's are going to actively kill infected cells. Regulatory T's help to kind of dampen the immune response. So we want to control um, autoimmunity. So instead of um, the immune system kind of going, getting a little overzealous, uh, we kind of rein it back a little bit. Right? Um, and memory cells are those cells that are going to, um, they're going to be generated during that initial response and they allow us to respond more quickly and efficiently to subsequent encounters with that same antigen. Um, and then of course your antigen presenting cells are either dendritic cells, macrophages, or B cells that are going to present antigens um, to a T cell for activation. Um, and then some different molecules involved in the immune response. So antigens again are antibody generating substances, anything that provokes that immune response. Um, antibodies are those proteins, little Y or T-shaped proteins produced by the plasma cells that are going to bind to antigens. So they're going to 
um, kind of mark or tag those antigens for destruction by other cells. Okay. Um, perforins, granzymes are chemicals that can be released by the cytotoxic T cells to either create pores in the target cell membrane or trigger that apoptosis cell suicide. Um, Complement is just going to kind of enhance other immune responses like inflammation um, and opsonization. Um, and cytokines are chemical messengers of the immune system. So looking at the cellular immune response now, so the T cell portion of adaptive immunity. Um, so we said T cells provide defense against intracellular agents or antigens. So they're going to attack infected cells. So cells infected with viruses or bacteria, cancer cells, or foreign transplanted cells. So some T cells can directly kill cells. Others are going to help regulate the re immune response. So T cells are a little more complex than B cells in both their classification and function. So B cells, we really only had one type of B cell. So B cell becomes a plasma cell that produces antibodies. So with T cells, we have kind of two different developmental pathways depending on the initial type of T cell. So CD4 cells are going to differentiate and become uh, helper T's or regulatory T's. Okay. Um, and some can also form those memory cells. And so again showing um, that antigen presentation to activate the T cell to cause it to proliferate, make copies, and then differentiate into helper T's, regulatory T's. CD8 cells are going to become your cytotoxic T. So they only have one possible uh, path of development. So they can form memory cells and cytotoxic T's. So the helper regulatory and activate or cytotoxic T's are considered activated, right? Because they have received exposure to an antigen which turned the T cell on, which activated it to allow it to proliferate and make copies. Okay. Um, so before the T cell encounters that antigen, remember it's still considered to be naive. Right? So it's completed its education, but it doesn't have any real world experience yet. Okay. So at this point, they're still referred to as CD4 or CD8. Right? So T cells are only going to respond to these processed fragments of antigens that are displayed by the, our antigen presenting cells. Um, so again, that antigen presentation is crucial for activation of these naive T cells um, and normal functioning of the T cells. So antigen presentation, so say our dendritic cell phagocyte engulfs a bacteria it processes it and then displays fragments of that antigen on its surface. Mm -hmm. um, so then the T cell is going to recognize that antigen and become activated, okay. which would lead to um, the proliferation and differentiation. So we're gonna form a bunch of clones of those T cells. Okay. Um, so <clears throat> the process of T cell activation actually requires two steps. Okay. So the activation is a two-step process. So you have the first step of antigen binding, and then it requires a second step called co-stimulation. Um, so both steps will occur on the surface of the same antigen presenting cell, um, but they're both going to be required for that um, proliferation, that cloning process of the T cells. So we're going to talk about antigen binding. So the T cell receptors um, are going to bind to the um, antigen presenting cell. Right? Um, but we have to have what's called a double recognition. So we have to recognize not only the MHC proteins, um, but also the foreign antigen. So it's kind of a two-step process. Okay, so the binding of these proteins will kickstart the pathways to begin our T cell activation. Right, so co-stimulation was the second step to um, complete T cell activation. Um, so without this second signal, this co-stimulatory signal, the T cell will 
be unable to divide, it will pretty much stop what it's doing. So it's not going to continue the process. Um, so this two-step process is just kind of a safeguard against unwanted T-cell activation. So we don't want to activate T-cells if we don't have to, because then we could have problems with maybe autoimmune disorders. Um, so one way to think of this could be, um, so when you get in the car, so you put your keys in the car, you crank the car, so that is your first step, that's your um, your antigen binding, right? But you're not going to go anywhere until you put the car in gear. So putting it in gear is going to be your co-stimulatory um, factor. Right, so now we can continue um, the process. Okay, so once the T cell has been activated, so we had both um, both signals accepted, right? So we can continue to proliferation and differentiation. So the T cells become activated, they're going to start um, dividing and making clones. So we have lots of copies of our T cells. Right? Again, because when we're dealing with an infection, we don't have time to wait for the bone marrow to make new lymphocytes. So we need those lymphocytes now. Right? So instead of waiting to make new ones, we just make clones or copies of the ones that we already have. Um, so this process takes about a week to reach its maximum peak of T-cell um, response and then it will gradually start to decline um, between 7 and 10 days, 7 and 30 days after. Um, and of course the memory cells will always remain so um, we can mediate those secondary immune responses. Um, so we mentioned cytokines earlier, that they're basically just the chemical messengers of the immune system. So they're going to mediate different um, processes like cell development, differentiation, and uh, immune system responses. Um, so the primary cytokines um, in the immune system we'll look at are interferons and interleukins. So we already talked about interferons uh, in last section with the innate system. So interferons are going to interfere with viral reproduction. So there are antiviral um, chemicals. Um, interleukins are um, there's a whole group of interleukins. You don't need to know all of these. Just know generally what they do. Um, they're chemical messengers that help mediate other aspects of the immune system. So it can help to activate macrophages, um, can stimulate lymphocyte proliferation, differentiation, um, causes some cells to secrete antibodies, a wide range of functions. Okay, so now looking at some specific effector T cells and what they do, starting with the helper T's. Um, so the helper T's are probably the most important of the T cells because they're essentially going to activate um, aspects in both the humoral and the cellular branches. So they help activate the antibody response and the cellular response. Okay. Um, so we can activate B cells and T cells, induce proliferation. Uh, we can also secrete cytokines to recruit other immune cells. So ultimately without the helper T's there would be no immune response. So um, the other immune cells are reliant on the helper T for their activation. So back when we talked about antigen presentation or antigen presenting cells, um, they have to present the antigen to the helper T for activation. Um, so there's different classes of helper T's. You don't need to know specifics. Um, these are just some examples of what different helper T's um, can do. Um, so activation of CD8 cells. Right? So um, CD8 cells only become uh, cytotoxic T's. Right? Um, so they require the assistance of that helper T to become activated um, to differentiate into the cytotoxic T. Um, so also dendritic cells can express those um, co-stimulatory molecules to activate CD8 cells as well. So we have that um, antigen binding and co-stimulation. So helper T binds to a dendritic cell, stimulates the dendritic cell to express those co-stimulatory molecules, which can now activate our CD8 to transform into the cytotoxic T. Um, as far as helper T's role with um, humoral immunity, so same kind of thing, so we can bind to a B cell, right? um, 
with that antigen and release cytokines to tell that uh, B cell to now become activated and start producing antibodies. So we said the cytotoxic T's are the ones that can directly attack and kill other cells. So cyto means uh, cell, toxic means toxic. So these are toxic to cells or dangerous to other cells. Um, so once they're activated, they can circulate throughout the blood and lymph fluid and kind of patrol body cells looking for any foreign antigen they may recognize. Okay. Um, so typically they'll target cells infected with viruses or intracellular parasites, um, cancer cells, and foreign um, like transfused or transplanted cells. So anything that doesn't have that self-identifying MHC marker. So the way cytotoxic T's work to kill infected cells is by using perforins and granzymes by exocytosis. So we already mentioned these a little bit. Um, perforins are going to perforate the cell membrane. So we're going to poke holes and pores in the cell membrane um, to make its contents leak out to maybe kill the cell. Um, and then these granzymes, these enzymes, are going to activate um, apoptosis. So we're essentially going to trigger cell destruction um, with these chemicals. Um, so then the last T cell to look at is the regulatory T cell. So we said this one is just going to help regulate other aspects of the immune response um, to maybe dampen or hinder it a little bit so it doesn't get carried away and start killing off um, your own cells. So it's going to be important in preventing autoimmune reaction. So it can inhibit dendritic cells um, or suppress other T cells. Okay, so simplified summary of primary immune response. So innate defenses again would include our surface barriers, the skin, mucous membranes, um, internal defenses would be things like um, fever, inflammation, antimicrobial proteins and things. Um, so adaptive defenses, if um, whatever pathogen or infection manages to get past our first two lines of defense, then we kick in the adaptive defenses. So our dendritic cell encounters a, a bacteria or an infected cell it's going to engulf it and then display those uh, antigens on its surface. Right, so it brings those antigens to the T cells for activation. Right? Um, so then those T cells are going to differentiate into helper T's and cytotoxic T's right, and regulatory T's. Um, so then the helper T's can also release some cytokines to um, stimulate other immune cells like the macrophages and the natural killer cells of the innate system. Okay. Um, so we can also use um, these to activate the B cells. Okay. So um, the B cells become activated and then they start to produce antibodies. Okay. So then the antibodies will circulate through the body fluids and um, bind to those antigens to try to neutralize them or remove them from the fluids. So again, summarizing everything, so we looked at B cells mature in the bone marrow. Right? They form plasma cells. Plasma cells produce antibodies. Right? Helper T cells help to activate other parts of the immune system. Uh, cytotoxic T's are going to directly kill infected cells using those perforins and granzymes. So we can poke holes in the membrane and we can trigger um, apoptosis, cell suicide. Um, regulatory T's are going to kind of dampen the immune response so we avoid autoimmunity. Uh, memory cells allow us to have quicker, more efficient responses to subsequent encounters with the same antigen. Right? And antigen presenting cells are going to um, engulf and digest the antigens and then present them to the T cells for activation. And again, antigen, anything that generates an immune response. Um, so looking at organ transplants and how we can try to prevent rejection. So the most common type of organ transplant is an allograft, which would be a transplant from the same species. So you would receive 
you know, an organ from another human. Right? Um, there are other types of transplants from different species, so those would be called a xenograft. So um, it is fairly common for pig or cow, say heart valves um, in some transplants. Uh, but the success of a transplant is going to depend on how similar the tissues are. So the more similar the tissues are, the least likely um, they'll be to reject right, or cause an immune reaction. So some similarity things we would look for would be the blood type, so blood antigens, um, MHC antigens, right, as, try to match those as closely as possible. Um, so then generally after surgery, the patient would have to be treated with immunosuppressants um, to help suppress the immune system so it doesn't you know, freak out and start to attack the new organ or new tissue. Uh, but there are side effects from that as well, including um, secondary infection. So if we weaken our immune system, we're going to be more susceptible to um, infections and pathogens getting in the body. Uh, so some problems you may see with the immune system include things like immunodeficiencies. So this could be either congenital or acquired, meaning either you can be born with it or you could acquire it later in life. Um, but ultimately it's going to impair the function of your immune system or the production of cells in the immune system. Um, so one of the most well known is SCID or Severe Combined Immunodeficiency Syndrome. So this is a genetic defect. Um, that's going to cause problems in B cell and T cell production. Um, so since B cells and T cells are formed in the bone marrow, it can be treated with a bone marrow transplant. So normal person, right, would have normal lymphocytes and they can fight off infection. So if you don't have enough T cells or B cells or you don't have any B cells or T cells, um, then that's going to decrease your immune response where you're unable to fight off those infections. Um, another type of immunodeficiency could be Hodgkin's disease. So this is an acquired immunodeficiency that is essentially a cancer of the B cells. Um, so it's going to depress the lymph node cells, um, which leads to that immunodeficiency. So remember we had a lot of uh, B cells in those germinal centers of the lymph node. Um, so if we're not producing adequate B cells, then we're not going to be able to properly filter and clean that lymph fluid. Um, so then pathogens and things are able to spread through the body. Um, so Hodgkin's disease or Hodgkin's lymphoma is um, diagnosed by this owl-shaped appearance of the, um, the lymphocyte. Okay. Um, so clonal B cell malignancy develops within the lymphatic system. So it has a bilobe nucleus that resembles an owl's eyes appearance. Right? Um, so B cells in one lymph node um, can spread to other lymph nodes as well. Um, another common type of immunodeficiency is the acquired immune deficiency syndrome or AIDS. So AIDS is caused by the human immunodeficiency virus, HIV. Um, it essentially cripples the immune system by interfering with the CD4 activity. Right? So remember CD4 cells go on to become the helper T's. The helper T's are what activate every other branch of the immune system, every other um, type of immune cell. So without the helper T's, the rest of our immune cells are pretty much useless. Right? They're not going to be able to become activated. So when our um, immune system is weakened, that's when we would have some secondary or opportunistic infections occur. Um, so normally, right, you have, um, like I said, you're always exposed to bacteria and viruses, things in the environment, but our immune system is pretty well um, efficient at keeping us healthy from those, taking care of those, kind of nipping them in the bud. But if your immune system is weakened, then just a normal standard um, infection could become something much more serious. Uh, and of course HIV is transmitted through body fluids like blood and semen. Um, so autoimmune diseases would result when the immune system loses the ability to distinguish self from non-self. So essentially the immune system is attacking the body's own cells. Right? Um, so we'll produce antibodies against our own cells um, and the cytotoxic T cells become sensitized to those and will start to destroy our own body tissues.
Um, so just a few examples of some common autoimmune disease, things like rheumatoid arthritis, which is going to attack the articular um, capsules, the joints in the body uh, and the muscles. Um, Crohn's disease, diabetes, um, lupus, leukemia, multiple sclerosis, which attacks the myelin sheath, um, which is the insulation on the covering of nerves. Um, Graves' disease in the thyroid, right? so the immune system attacks the thyroid cells. Um, so these are all examples of autoimmune diseases. So autoimmune diseases typically can be treated by suppressing the entire immune system. So things like anti-inflammatory drugs, um, anything to block the cytokine action to stop those chemical messages from being sent, or blocking those co-stimulatory molecules. Remember, we need that two-step approval process for uh, T-cell activation. So maybe if we can block that second signal, we can stop those T-cells from becoming activated and destroying our tissues. Yeah.